So for those in the room that don't know me, I think most people do, I'm a fourth year resident in OB-GYN. And just as was said, I'm going to chat a little bit about the clinical learning environment today and specifically talk about outcomes from a consensus conference on the learning environment that occurred before ICRE 2018 and the framework that we uh, developed to approach the learning environment that came out of that consensus conference. And then I'm also going to speak in a little bit more depth to the psychological uh, aspects of learning and psychological safety in the learning environment because that's my particular um, field of interest and I just know a little bit more about that area. Um, so I just sort of went through those objectives. So I wanted to start by providing a definition of what the clinical learning environment is. And this is a definition that came forward from the Harvard Massey Foundation also in 2018. And define the learning environment as the social interactions, organizational cultures and structures and physical and virtual spaces that surround and shape participants' experiences, perceptions and learning. And so where does that happen in clinical education? It happens in this really unique area that's sort of boundaried by the work, uh, working and learning environment and there's this overlap where sometimes goals are aligned and sometimes they're conflicting. Um, recognizing that we come to work to provide patient care and sometimes the provision of patient care uh, and safety can interfere with learning and vice versa. And why is it important to understand this dynamic um, and really have a solid approach for looking at the learning environment critically and academically um, it's because the learning environment affects so many aspects of patient care and healthcare provider wellness, patient safety, and ultimately comes down to sustainability of our systems, both education systems and healthcare systems. Um, when we look at uh, hot topics like burnout, work hours, system constraints, financial, time constraints of physicians, all of that is affected in some way by the learning environment and also influences our learning environment. I put learner future practice up there because I'm sure uh, most of you know that um, where we train follows us. And when we look at um, surgical error rates and complication rates or prescriber um, practices, it follows us from our residency training. Um, so the learning environment has a big influence there too. So um, after consensus uh, with a group of experts and then also attendees of the, uh, the consensus conference, this is the framework that we developed to approach the clinical learning environment in, um, to break it down into different avenues, recognizing fully that all of these avenues have some aspects where they overlap. So um, the breakdown is psychological, educational, sociocultural, architectural, that's supposed to say, um, digital and diversity and inclusion. And um, the outcomes of this conference were all published in a special issue of Medical Teacher, uh, the references of which I have at the end of these slides. Um, if they're circulated, you'll have those references. And the papers sort of summarize the approach to the clinical learning environment wholly and then speaks about each of the different avenues independently. So um, I worked primarily on the psychological paper. Um, so again, I'll speak to that more in depth, but I'm gonna summarize the key points that came out um, from each of the consensus within each avenue um, and to, to what each of those avenues is speaking. <clears throat> so let's just start with the architectural avenue. This uh, is an area that re recognizes the influence of physical spaces on processes and education. And so there are two theories through which we have decided uh, to look at the architectural aspects of the clinical learning environment. The first is materialist spatiality, uh, which focuses on the ways learning spaces and curricula can influence one another in productive and non-productive ways. So the example of this is considering how a learner can be involved in patient care at the bedside and then take time to remove themselves from the bedside and have a discussion with team members more in private, in a separate location, where more in-depth learning can happen and a more in-depth discussion of the case can happen, and then go back to the bedside and provide that information for the patient. So just considering the spaces in which that can happen feasibly and safely for everybody is an important thing. The other theory is actor network theory, um, which is a consideration of how people behave in spaces and impact of spaces on those behaviors and on people. And it offers a framework for being able to interpret the surprises that come out of spaces and how spaces are used, even when those spaces are specifically design, designed for a purpose. So the example being a space in a medical school building that's designed for medical students to use for small group learning. And then you find out a year after it's been built that it's also used by 
clinical residents and faculty for their case rounds because that space has a lot of whiteboards and it's set up so that it facilitates those case rounds really nicely. And that was an unintended group of people that's using that space regularly. And so this theory allows us to dive into what are the aspects of the physical space that make that um, happen. The next avenue I'm going to speak to is the digital avenue. Um, and Andrew Hall from Emerge uh, contributed to this paper uh, with some other authors and it contributed to the consensus piece. Um, this was a really interesting avenue because there's so much emerging digital technology uh, in our world that we don't really have a great conceptual framework on how to handle right now. Um, so the key things that came out of this consensus were um, some recommendations, but also just a consideration of how to frame um, positive and negative aspects of using uh, digital um, uh, technology in our learning environment. So um, after the uh, consensus with participants at the conference, a thematic analysis was done and there were three major themes that came out of the discussion with attendees. The first was digital communication. And specifically within digital communication, there was a recognition that there's enhanced efficiency of communication between teams when digital communication is used. Uh, for example, a junior communicating with a senior or staff by uh, WhatsApp when those people are also busy managing other things. It provides the opportunity to quickly send a message or send an image of an x-ray or an ultrasound, for example. Uh, but there were also concerns raised regarding the safety and privacy of patient information and how we consent patients uh, for sending their personal information via digital communication. And also the concern around losing the face-to-face -face interaction um, between healthcare providers and losing that learning aspect um, and how important that was. Within the second theme, digital learning resources, there was the recognition that there really are no bounds to our learning resources now. Uh, when you consider platforms such as blogs and Twitter, the access is international, um, which is a real uh, positive aspect um, for opportunities to get that information, recognizing also the concern that some of that information might not be accurate. And so how do we verify the accuracy of information that learners are accessing? Um, so in, ensuring the educational quality and also, again, concerns with sharing um, digital patient information on those social network spheres um, and how we document and get patient consent for that. So the example being posting something on Twitter about a really cool x-ray and sort of giving some details of the case without even any patient information. How do we really truly document that that patient was okay with that? And if it has 5,000 impressions rather than 300 and that patient becomes uncomfortable with how widely it's shared, how do we manage that? So something that we would really, really haven't faced until recently. And then digital assessment and evaluation, particularly important as we've switched to CBME um, and require technological platforms to support all of the assessment that's required. Um, so appreciating that there are very new uh, approaches and how assessments are done using that digital technology and also recognizing the positives and negatives that can potentially come with that. So the positives being the opportunity to use data analytics on big data and appreciate how learners progress through residency from a real quantitative perspective um, and use that both for um, learner improvement but also for programmatic improvement. Uh, but also recognizing that if that data is digital and there's so much more of it, what access do people have if there's a poor patient outcome and there's a litigious action? Um, can that documentation be subpoenaed and used against a learner who didn't perform particularly well on that day, but overall is a, is a really excellent or, or well-performing resident. So um, concerns about the privacy. Um, the Inclusion Avenue um, reflected on how to take sort of superlative statements about diversity and inclusion that we all have in our programmatic policy and actually put it into action. Um, it and, and so in doing that, reflected on uh, the importance of recognizing the uniqueness and promoting belongingness. Belongingness being fostered by minimizing hierarchical, hierarchical decision making and attention to safety within the clinical learning environment. Um, it also, um, Salim Razak, who wrote this paper, is, is said something that was um, really impactful to me in that he said, diversity is not actually a problem that we are trying to fix and trying to make better. It's just a trait of a group of people within a population. And recognizing that the diversity is the difference 
Um, it's, the, it's the things that not all people have within that population and being part of a shared group. So, so recognizing that it's not, it really isn't a problem to be fixed and should be embraced as, all, as part of all populations. Um, he talks about equity uh, addressing and the importance of addressing ongoing injustices experienced by marginalized populations. Um, the importance of inclusive living and learning spaces being co-created, um, so considering all stakeholders who will be working and learning in that space um, and how can we build that space together with shared values. And also being, um, being aware of pitfalls that can happen within this field. So um, the three that he mentioned were neutrality, conflated outcomes, and nostalgia. Nostalgia being anchoring to practices that were okay in the past. So making a comment about how a woman appears and thinking it should be a compliment and it would have been okay to say that 20 years ago, but it's not okay to say that now. So not allowing for that sort of thing to continue happening, and you could say that about any number of populations. Um, conflated outcomes being, uh, again, recognizing that saying, if we in improve diversity, we'll improve um, uh, resident education, or if we reflect on the diversity of this group, patient outcomes will be better. And those are things that you really can't connect, and you like making those statements makes you feel like you're doing something when you're really not. Um, and neutrality was an interesting concept, um, and the example that Salim used that I'm going to use because it helped me understand this concept was of a um, pediatrics group doing ward rounds and reflecting on the fact that they had a higher than usual number of patients from Northern Ontario who had a certain type of pneumonia and making very othering comments about that population and their um, prognostic sort of health predictors, not recognizing that one of the residents in that group actually had Aboriginal status, although she didn't outwardly appear a minority, she did identify. And so the approach as a leader of that discussion would not to be would not be to say, well, let's look at both sides of this argument. It would just be, let's discuss all of our views. Instead of polarizing one view versus another, just hear everybody. Um, so that was, that's the example of um, making sure there's neutrality and not uh, opposing sides on, on perspectives. <clears throat> the sociocultural avenue explores how workplaces and people within those workplaces places facilitate the access to knowledge and underscores the importance of understanding institutional culture. So culture and climate are two words that are commonly used interchangeably, but do actually mean slightly different things. Culture is the deeply rooted underlying beliefs and, and, and um, values of an institution, whereas climate is the more transient attitudes and perspectives of people who work within that institution. So really understanding the culture of, cu culture of institutions is important within this um, avenue. Um, consideration of the divide between microsystems and institutional leadership and regulation. So that's a mouthful, but I'm going to break that down by giving another example. Um, microsystems being um, residents and faculty or learners and faculty and um, institutional leadership being PGME or national licensing bodies or um, unions. So the example um, to stereotype of a general surgery resident who is self-sacrificing works all hours that they need to to provide patient care um, and is really sort of regimented to that idea of I am going to work no matter what because there needs to be coverage. Contrasting that to dis despite their sort of regimented approach to that, they're willing to skirt rules around duty hours. So they feel very strongly that this is our culture, this is what we need to do, and yet they don't respect the culture of recognizing that, in fact, patient safety is affected by how many hours we work, potentially, and fatigue and decision making. So although their goal really is to provide good patient care and provide coverage on the call schedule, they have these two conflicting um, values. So that was the example there. Um, exploring what social dynamics affect learning opportunities within the clinical learning environment um, and conflicts between informal and formal entrustment within CBME. So this meant the, to really understand um, the interpersonal um, qualities that affect faculty decisions to informally trust residents for, to complete tasks that they are not formally signed off on. 
So when you're on call at night and it's busy and you've worked with this resident a lot before and you trust them to call you when they're out of their comfort zone, you might trust them to do something a little bit more complicated if they say, I can handle this, even if they haven't been formally signed off on that EPA. So understanding the dynamics between learners and supervisors um, when those decisions come into play falls also within this avenue. Uh, and the last one before I go into the psychological avenue is the education avenue, and this sort of seems obvious um, because post-grad education and the clinical learning environment should have a lot to do with uh, education and learning. But really, if we don't make um, this explicit, um, sometimes we can lose sight of how to really critically look at it. Um, so this avenue focused on defining uh, curriculum content and really reflected on curriculum mapping and the importance of aligning needs and goals and, goals and assessments um, and outcomes, um, with particular importance to transitions in residency training to minimize learner stress and increase learner confidence. Um, then also looks at the practical implementation of curricula, um, so designing program models and curriculum deployment, and the pros and cons of each of the different models, so thinking about um, longitudinal uh, curricula and how they provide potentially more opportunities for role modeling and mentorship um, versus some other uh, structures. Um, teaching and learning strategies, so just reflecting on the greater shift towards trainee empowerment um, over teaching and learning within CVME, and the use of coaching approaches um, as opposed to didactic approaches, and emphasis on narratives and reflection has been a shift recently. Um, assessment system, particularly uh, making a note that if the assessment system is not aligned with the curriculum, there's going to be a huge conflict there, so um, that was a separate point to make sure that that was um, emphasized. Um, and then recognizing the critical need to balance goals at all levels involved in the clinical learning environment. So recognizing the learner, the teachers, PGME, and larger uh, bodies and what their goals are and trying to align those as best as we can, recognizing that there can often be conflicts. And finally, um, faculty development um, being super critically important to um, ongoing development on the quality of teaching um, and feedback and everything that falls into that, and also um, recognizing that it provides the opportunity to address gaps and also uh, is a real um, agent for change. Um, and then uh, the formal and informal curricula also sort of fall into the education avenue. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to take the last half of this presentation to talk about the psychological avenue. And we approached this avenue um, a little bit too pronged, but there's a lot of overlap between the two. So reflecting on theories of learning that can be applicable to the clinical learning environment, and also reflecting on psychological safety and its impact on the clinical learning environment, both from a learning perspective and also from a patient safety perspective. So I'm going to start by talking about a couple theories of learning, which some of you probably recognize, um, and then reflect on how those can be applied to the learning environment. Um, Social cognitive theory is a theory that I really, really like, um, and my thesis was kind of anchored on it, so I understand it pretty well. Um, and it, it, the learning environment is integral to that, and I think it's so important in, in the clinical learning environment because we can't separate the clinical learning environment from learning in, in, in residency training. Um, so it says that we learn from an interaction with others and within our environment, um, recognizing that those, are, those things, three things up there are all very much intertwined. It also says all learners have five fundamental abilities that allow or support learning in all environments. Those, so those are the ability to symbolize, have forethought, learn vicariously, self-regulate, and self-reflect. Um, cognitive load theory is also a theory that's very relevant to clinical um, learning. Uh, when we think about how busy our learning environments often are and how much uh, extra stress and load can be on learners when they're trying to learn to do a task or learn knowledge for the first time. So cognitive load theory reflects on uh, the capacity of the working memory and um, breaks the working memory or that area of our brain that we're sort of constantly um, uh, completing tasks with, breaks it into three different components. The intrinsic component being the difficulty of the task at hand. So how difficult is this math pro problem to complete for this learner? Extrinsic load is the other distracting things that are um, distracting the, learn the person in the math example from doing that math problem. So the fire alarm goes off. 
Are you going to ignore the fire alarm? Are you going to respond to the fire alarm and keep doing your question? That dis those distracting thoughts are also a component of the working memory. And then the last component is the germane load. And that's the part of the working memory that's working to connect to previously made schema in the long-term memory and connect to um, pre-existing knowledge so that you can save the knowledge from the new experience. And sorry, I should say when they're imbalanced. So the ideal learning environment has an optimized intrinsic load. So the difficulty of the task is appropriate for the learner and their level. The extrinsic load is minimized and allows lots of space for germane um, load to be learning for future use. Communities of practice is another theory. We explore it in the psychology or psychological avenue. Um, and this is a concept that captures the importance of actively integrating individuals within a community um, and legitimizing individual practices. And the goal of this concept is to move learners from a more peripheral position into really integral members of a patient care team. There are three um, really fundamental parts of communities of of the concept of community and practice. The first is mutual engagement. The second is joint enterprise. And the third is shared repertoire. So within mutual engagement, um, the concept is uh, that this is achieved by interaction and sociocultural activities, i.e. sharing tasks and sharing opportunities with all members of the group. Joint enterprise is the idea that a community needs to come up with their own mandate and their own set of goals that's internally driven rather than having an external um, force place that mandate upon them. And shared repertoire um, is the concept of sharing ideas, sharing language, um, sharing common practices, and, and uh, helps with supporting a feeling of a strong community of practice. Finally, psychological safety. I'm going to just present a couple of definitions um, of psychological safety. So the degree to which learners perceive their work environment as conducive to engaging in behaviors that have inherent intrapersonal risk. So what this means is if they do something, if they admit that they don't know something and ask a question with an opportunity to learn, or if they speak up because they're concerned about patient safety, how concerned are they that they are going to ruin their reputation and the relationship with that person that they're trying to ask the question of or speak up to? Or a feeling or climate whereby the learner can feel valued and comfortable, yet still speak up and take risk without fear of retribution, embarrassment, judgment, or consequences, either to themselves or others, thereby promoting learning and innovation. <clears throat> so when we think about all of these things in the context of social cognitive theory within the learning environment and how the learning activity that you're doing um, within that learning environment affects the learners, there's a ton of connections. Um, maybe not published in the literature, but certainly you can think about it theoretically. Um, and I'm sure we've all been in situations where our cognitive load has been overloaded and affected our ability to either supervise or actually as a learner do something. Um, and you can see how the learning environment has big influences um, on all of these concepts too. So this is really what we explored within this avenue and ultimately came up with some recommendations that I'll speak to uh, towards the end. But really the bottom line, as I mentioned, is that um, psychological safety not only has an impact on learner, learner's ability to learn, but also has a huge impact on uh, patient safety. And we know that communication breakdown, for whatever reason, has a big impact on um, on adverse patient events. So it's a really important concept to understand and, and mitigate or make sure is, is present. Um, there have been a few studies looking at factors that are associated with higher levels of psychological safety, so I'm going to speak to those a little bit. Um, the first uh, couple studies found, interestingly, that male residents seem to have higher psychological safety. There seems to be no association with level of training, which I thought was interesting, but then on reflection, thought a little bit about our MFM case rounds and how I experienced that as a junior and a senior. And as a junior, I thought, well, if I get the question wrong, who cares? Nobody expects me to know the answer. But I was nervous about speaking up because I may not have known all of the people in the room and how my relationship might be affected by, by my answer. Now as a senior, I know all the people there, but if I get it wrong, maybe I was expected to know the answer. So the stress around that and, and the concern about relationships um, may just change as you progress through training. And then medicine and psychiatry specialties seem to have higher psychological safety. Other factors, um, the feeling that residents felt they could bring up problems, which is not surprising. Um, that's all problems, not just related to patient safety, but uh, that falls very nicely in the definition of psychological safety. Trust, a feeling of trust and confidentiality within the team, improved connection within the team, um, 
and interestingly, connection can also improve trainee empowerment um, and the ability to acknowledge uncertainty and sense of belongingness. And this is a really important one and, in, and also interestingly overlaps with the uh, inclusion uh, avenue. Um, but a sense of belongingness really um, is associated with a feeling of being safe, comfortable, satisfied, and happy within the learning environment. It's related to self-esteem and resilience, um, feelings of connectedness, confidence, degree of self-efficacy, and the extent to which they're willing to question uh, or conform to poor practice. Facility factors that are associated with uh, higher um, psychological safety, so less complex um, facilities, so not tertiary care level centers like here. Um, overall satisfaction with learning experience and controlled environments, so not chaos, but um, things that are more controlled generally. Um, patient factors, so older patients who have multiple illnesses, who have good social supports and no mental illness, tend to be associated with a higher psychological safety of the care providers. So I, I wanted to look a little bit to SIM, uh, the SIM literature too, because there's a lot of uh, things from that literature that we can apply to the clinical learning environment um, in terms of how we as um, teachers can facilitate a psychologically safe learning environment. So qualities of the facilitator, at least in simulation, um, that were associated with higher psychological safety include being approachable, accessible, inviting. Um, the perceived level of feedback given from the facilitators, um, I think, probably um, gave a feeling of that facilitator being invested in the learning opportunity. Um, admitting mistakes, on, being honest and flexible, and being prepared. The learning activity attributes, so having an orientation to the learning activity, and specifically an orientation to the physical environment. So interestingly, again, an overlap with architectural avenue there. But having, and it's something that I often don't think about when um, clerks have been around labor and delivery for a shift, but maybe like reorienting them to where you get this and where you get this and specifically what are the objectives of this shift uh, might actually be important on more than one occasion. Um, preparation and ease of transfer, so being, pro being provided with uh, material that can prepare the learner for that activity and then easily being able to apply that new knowledge um, and clear objectives and expectations. <coughs> And factors that are associated with a lack of or lower psychological safety are not surprising. So ambiguity and expectations, uncertainty in their role, constant evaluation, which is interesting in the context, context of CBME, um, as we're trying to shift that feeling of being constantly evaluated to being constantly coached. It's a difficult um, line to walk. Um, unsupportive faculty and colleague response to normal learning behaviors, um, shaming, manners of teaching, and poor communication. Um, there was, I'm going to talk a little bit about the OR as a learning environment next, so I'll put that up because it's a nice picture that I got from a patient, but um, there, there was a study by um, Dr. Uh, Biko, is that how you say his name in urology? Biko? That looked at um, facilit well, leader attributes within the OR, and I'm mentioning this because of uh, a facilitator, what was in the last slide that cued me to that? Um, no. Poor communication, a shaming manners of teaching. That's what made me think of it. So he looked at different leadership styles within the OR and leadership styles that promoted leadership and exploration in uh, other learners in the OR was not actually ne necessarily associated with higher psychological safety, but leadership styles that were shaming and negative and undermining were associated with lower psychological safety. So when we think about the OR as a learning environment, um, just to take a moment to reflect on uh, the learning environment that I am often in. Um, it is a super high cognitive load environment, and that can be said of many clinical learning environments, uh, but to look at this one as a specific example. So the intrinsic load of a learner in the OR. You are learning to do a surgery you may or may not have done before. You're actually physically doing the surgery, so that takes a part of your working memory. Understanding the anatomy, which may or may not be straightforward depending on the case complexity, and also thinking about anticipating the next step. So it can be really, really challenging, just the task. And then you add all the other stuff in the OR, the distractions, the pages, the calls, hearing about your patient in PACU, the time pressure of the OR, the nurse saying your next case is going to be canceled because you don't have enough time to finish it. And feeling stressed about that as a learner because you're trying to learn but appreciate that you might be a little bit slower, so where, you know, that's, that's stress inducing and how do you decide when to say, okay, I'm okay with not doing this or when does the staff decide to, to take over? So there's a lot of other stuff happening that can increase the stress of a learner in the OR. 
So I don't know how we learn to do surgery in that environment, but somehow we, we do. And I will reflect on that. I'm going to come back again to the five um, capabilities within um, social cognitive theory and my own reflection on how I think that helps with learning in high cognitive load environments. Um, So what contributes to stress in the operating room specifically? Um, it's influenced by a number of things, including personal and situational characteristics, emotions, self-esteem, resilience. Um, learner factors that contribute to interoperative stress include fatigue, interpersonal conflicts, uh, which is not surprising um, and relates directly to psychological safety, um, and surgical errors. Aspects of the other aspects of the OR specific environment that cause interoperative stress, those disruptions that I was talking about, time pressures, um, how complex the case is, how high risk the patient is, surgeon temperament. <clears throat> and the response to stress, stress is also variable. So it depends on the context, coping mechanisms that the learner has, and also psychological resilience of that learner. And also it depends on how the uh, faculty mitigates any stress specifically related to an intraoperative error that might have been made or a near miss. Um, and managing that error not as an opportunity to berate, but actually an opportunity for learning and reflection, while still emphasizing the importance and the potential damage that that error could have caused, um, but, but being more supportive rather than emphasizing the mistake um, that was made. Um, this is a reflection of um, those theories and how I think about um, learning in the OR and how stress can influence extrinsic cognitive load and how psychological safety can influence extrinsic cognitive load and how that can all potentially have a negative impact on their germane load. And I said I would talk about how do we possibly learn in the OR. And so these are the um, five sort of capabilities that support learning in all different environments. And there has been some literature that actually suggests that the learning can't only happen in the OR and we have to actually, actually have to take it out of that high cognitive load environment and support learning um, outside of that context. Um, so symbolizing forethought, learning vicariously is all things that learners might do before going into the OR. Symbolizing being visualizing what they're going to do, um, thinking about it in advance. Learning vicariously through talking to senior residents who have done this case before. Um, and then afterwards, self-regulating and self-reflecting. Um, and so I've probably talked to a lot of you about my, my thesis, but I looked at using video playback as an opportunity to um, review what happened actually in the OR and explore what happened in that dialogue. Um, and ultimately what came out of it is that it was a very helpful tool because it provided that opportunity for reflection after the OR while maintaining that contextual verity of what happened in that specific case that that learner was doing. Um, so just reflected on the importance of also learning Supporting clinical learning environment learning outside of the clinical learning environment while maintaining the clinical context. So um, these are the uh, sort of recommended outcomes that came out of the psychological uh, avenue within that medical teacher publication uh, to enhance um, the psychological aspects of learning and psychological safety within the learning environment. So the first, embrace learning as a core value, which seems obvious, but similarly to why we included an education avenue within that framework, it's really important to make this explicit because it can be lost, potentially. Um, and so the way we recommended doing this was to have two concepts included in a common mission, sort of institutional mission. The first, optimizing the real-time clinical contributions of learners in a safe and supportive environment. And second, understanding that a well-trained and engaged future workforce will benefit the individual teaching institution as well as society as a whole. <clears throat> Strategy two, utilize the clinical care system as an education-rich environment. Um, and so in order to take advantage of this, institution leaders really should become actively involved in the design of learning opportunities. So the example being um, getting residents involved in the quality improvement processes that the hospital is doing, um, whether in a leadership role or a supportive role, um, would help make sure that the goals of those uh, two stakeholders are aligned. Develop individual level skills to optimize learning success, uh, sorry, learning process. So this um, speaks to um, yeah, so this speaks to having both um, faculty um, developing and constantly developing individual skills in coaching, but also speaks to a learner's uh, ongoing 
development in how to promote a positive learning environment, um, including learning specifically about active learning and exploring, uh, taking risks, and building self-efficacy. Rituals and rewards. I thought this was a really interesting one and a really easily practically applied strategy. Rituals that promote learning include taking opportunities through the day to not only um, talk about what was done, but actually reflect within your community of practice on um, what you learned from those experiences. So at handover, for example, don't just talk about there's this person, there's this person, there's this person, but also add, you know, through managing this person in labor through the night, I learned this. And this is something that the staff told me that I didn't know. Um, so really, and, and, and um, recognizing that initiative as, as a really positive thing. Recognizing the um, learning process as a positive thing and not sort of saying, well, I can't believe you didn't know that. Um, uh, yeah, develop simple gestures to acknowledge hard work and effort related to clinical learning. Strategy five, establish a just culture. So um, this is a concept that requires all team members are expected to advocate for an environment in which, environment in which um, safety concerns are raised and addressed in a non-punitive manner. So this is really getting at psychological safety, but not just the concept of psychological safety, making sure that everyone in that institution advocates for that culture to be present. Um, Six, remove competing factors. So this, this is talking about removing those unintended barriers to learning. So the example of the pager being in the OR. This is something that I have often been conflicted about because I recognize that as community physicians, we may be paged during a difficult case to manage our patient on the ward and have to be thinking about that at the same time. So when do we start to learn that ability to balance both things versus maybe we should be taking the pagers out of the OR and allowing residents to really focus on the learning opportunity at hand and minimizing all of those competing uh, factors and distractions. Um, the other example um, that we provided in the paper was uh, discussing protocolization of healthcare um, in sort of increasing patient safety standards and how that's really important but may deprive learners of important uh, opportunities to perform procedures or be involved in certain aspects of care. Um, and so emphasizing getting over that competing factor would be making sure there's really high fidelity SIM um, to provide that uh, learning opportunity. And the last thing that we spoke about here was making sure that education is incentivized. So removing the competing factor of faculty to be providing clinical care and clinical research and really incentivizing the education piece and recognizing the importance and expertise that goes into postgrad education. And the last strategy was building communities of practice. Um, so again, as I spoke about when I spoke about the theory, making sure there's a sense of connectedness, uh, shared values and goals, and making sure that everyone on the team has a really meaningful uh, role and feels like an integral member of that team. So I'm gonna put up the framework and that's the end of my presentation. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. <clears throat> decreased it, if I'm being totally honest. Because there's a sense of constant evaluation um, and that that evaluation is um, summative in nature and um, not there to provide coaching. Um, and also it's provided additional stress on um, like just getting assessments done and might have damaged some of the relationships between residents and faculty um, um, in needing to ask for assessments. So I, th I think it will eventually get better, but I think for now, for some people, it's, it's increased yeah, so how, that how risk. How do we make it better? Because we're, we're at the mm -hmm. front edge of the wave right mm -hmm. here. How do we make it better? Which, I how do you think? Yeah, I think part of it um, does, um, in some part, comes with education of residents in the purpose of those assessments. Um, and eventually just getting comfortable with the fact that they're not all supposed to be summative. They're little snapshots. Um, 
and teaching. I, I, there is evidence that learners become better learners when they learn theories of learning. So I think teaching some of that theory potentially to residents would be helpful. Um, and, and somehow taking our, out the sort of hierarchical nature of that assessment. And I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, the nice thing about all of us, all of us being <coughs> men is we've got lots of years ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think about a lot is how different all of our specialties are. And you know, your environment in the OR and OB and labor delivery is very different from my environment and the eMERGE, David's environment on board medicine. And part of me thinks that you know, if we take programmatic assessment, coaching, and our cultures, and you know, kind of a growth mindset, mm -hmm. Each of us will do it in a bit of a different way, and I think that's okay. But there's definitely a huge tension mm -hmm. with coaching versus assessment. Mm -hmm. Just because we as the leaders say, oh, it's just a teeny little formative assessment. It's nothing. It's just a little one-time EPA assessment. Mm -hmm. If the resident, and I'm stealing from like, Chris <coughs> Walton's work, if that's not perceived by the resident, then there's no psychological yeah. safety. And, it, and, it, and I do think it has the making it worse. Yeah. And then I think of Rhonda St. Croix thinking of the implementation yeah. dip. So I think our safety probably is dipped yeah. down, but that yeah. our trajectory is still. Yeah. Uh, and I'll be really. Agree with you. Yeah. I heard um, Jessica Trier's voice on the Providence yeah. Care site, but I'll be really interested to know what her research shows, because I think part, a huge part of it comes from not just the coaching technique, but the relationship between the coach and the learner. Because I have been coached the same way by different faculty and in one way felt criticized and in one way felt supported. So it's it's just, and I, I reflect on this all the time and I can't pinpoint what it is and it's something about the relationship I'm sure, but yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of ties in with what I was gonna say is that the other thing to, you know, a barrier in how to make it better with the CPME was also <laughs> As faculty, we've been trained in a particular system, and we've been training our resident in a particular system that we are forced to change, and that change is uncomfortable, and there is definitely development of faculty and how to provide feedback, and like, there's a lot of growth opportunity, and there's been some growing pains associated with that, and I think some of it also with coaching versus assessment, you know, we're learning this transition as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. uh, and feeling more and more Accepting of you know, as opposed to say, oh yeah, I'll do the CP one at a time. Mm -hmm. We're saying, yeah, that's an opportunity for me to actually give you that feedback right away. And so there's there's the um, the, the, the the pain of the the resident uh, learning to distinguish coaching and, and feedback and uh, assessment, but also the role of the attending learning to pro to do that because obviously I didn't you know I we all learn in a very 25 years ago, very different environment, yeah. different culture, and that's what we bring with us. Yeah. How we've been taught is how we teach, our, and then we learn differently according to the culture we are. We are influenced by our peers and how they do, and you know, with a new framework with a lot of development. Mm -hmm. You had your hand up. Uh, I was just reflecting on your statement about how different uh, people can result in different experiences of feedback yeah. and in terms of coaching. And so going back to Chris Watling's work, some of what he's talked about in the past is the idea of credibility. So a big part of what mm -hmm. residents do is make a judgment about how credible feedback is. Mm -hmm. And part of that credibility judgment involves who it's coming from mm -hmm. and how credible is that source of feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what you might be reflecting on is that credibility judgment that you make. Um, and we as faculty are observed constantly by our learners and they internalize that and then reflect on it when we give feedback and say, are you a person who's credible to me to mm -hmm. be giving that feedback in this circumstance mm -hmm. with these conditions? Um, and the other part that I was going to talk about was this idea of um, separating coaching and assessment I think is vitally important and probably also further separating the idea of judgment from documentation. Um, and so assessment is something that we kind of put as a catch bag, but I think what really learners probably fear is the judgment of saying, am I competent, am I not competent, do I progress, do I not progress, and those are the judgments being separated out from the documentation of, here's what happened today. Mm -hmm. um, we don't necessarily fear the idea of documentation, right. we do fear the idea 
some way to be able yeah. to separate those. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so one thing that stands out to me is, is I've lived my whole life in teaching hospitals. Um, and in fact, but our goal of teaching students is actually to leave, right? It's like parenting. Your goal is to actually get them to leave mm -hmm. uh, this. And the, when I hear about the clinical learning environment, I, I think we're, what we're actually looking more at in many ways is the clinical environment. And we happen to have a learning environment. And, and the question I have is, when people leave and actually go outside of some place where everyone's talking about the clinical learning environment, what are the impact of those experiences, positive or negative, actually on how they practice in community? Like when I look back on my training, I remember there was one time I got completely chewed out uh, for something and I was sort of angry, my feelings were hurt. And then I, you know, it took me a few years to realize my feelings were fine, my ego was hurt. Mm. Um, but that was probably the best feedback I ever got and changed my practice more than any other feedback I got in residency. And just thinking about downstream, mm -hmm. where does this go play out downstream? So, okay, I'm trying to understand your question. How, does the how, does, how do our experiences in the learning environment in residency affect our teaching in the future or our practice? So how, how does focusing on this now yeah. translate into practice change when you leave residency. How does, um, how does, do, I think we're I saying, it, is, there a, is there possibly a gap between our teaching culture and centers with the community centers and okay. when you practice independently? Is, the, is there a big More gap? More your experience of what's happening yeah, as a learner, does it mirror you, what's going on out in the community? When you move yeah. out of here, you're going to be in yeah. a very different environment. Are you equipped to deal with that environment? Okay. I don't know if I can answer that question. Okay. I would think so. So many people have gone out and they do manage. Um, but I guess, like, yeah, how can, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the it's answer. Like CBME, we still don't know what the outcome. Yeah. It's going to be like a process of continuously you brought up no, one. You already brought well, up yeah. one interesting point about the paging, right? And mm -hmm. the psychological safety here. You know, if we obviously we don't have pure, perfect psychological safety, but mm -hmm. if we could achieve it and make every learner feel perfectly safe, right? Take away every extrinsic mm -hmm. stress. Mm -hmm. Do we want to do that? Mm -hmm. And it gets at your example of the pager, right? Because right. then you go to the community. I see. I see. The, I see the point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't. It's that's a really good question. And maybe maybe it changes as you um, start residency. Like maybe we try and really optimize and focus on learning within that clinical environment, and then progress and integrate more. I don't know. Yeah. I thought, and I bet Mala can be much more articulate than me. Sorry, Mala, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but you know all the things that we learn like you learn the medicine and just to go see a patient first and then you learn to see multiple patients and then you learn to be on call you learn how to ask for help you learn how to manage everything right it's a developmental curve just like learning to drive or learning to do so many other things it's a complex thing that we do to me I look at this and think of your presentation and what we're talking about you know if we can get more and more people talking about so like, like all of the dimensions mm -hmm. of psychological safety and that we can't protect everybody from it. It's part of our world that we choose to be in, which has a lot of stress mm -hmm. and a lot of competing demands. If we actually put it out front a little bit more explicitly, I think we'll have better conversations. Mm -hmm. And that should go out into the community because yeah. this is not unique to an academic center versus a community. But if only a couple people are talking about it at an academic center, it's like, how do we take this yeah. topic area and really get everybody yeah. talking I see. about Sorry, okay, I may, I'm making more connections now, yeah. Think so I think the purpose of this is not to like shield learners from everything. Yeah. Um, and I think when we're talking specifically about psychological safety, it's not just about um, that impact on the ability to learn and perform, but also on patient safety. And it's not just about the physicians in that environment, it's also about the nursing staff saying, you're using that piece of equipment wrong, or you're gonna burn the bowel when you press on that button when you're using that instrument. So it's about the whole team. And there have been studies looking um, 
at cardiology um, ORs and having one set of team members that works in the same OR with the same group of surgeons all the time rather than having alternating nurses.